Hello there, and welcome back to the Photography Made Simple podcast with me, your host, Audrianne. I'm the founder of Live Snap Love, a photography education resource that aims to give you the tools and knowledge you need to capture the beauty of your days through photography. Whether that be documenting your daily family life with your children, recording your travels, or just seeing the beauty that's in your back garden, my goal is to make learning photography feel simple and fun so that you can start to take photos that you love quickly. Now today on the podcast, I'm answering a question that was asked during our live Q&A call that we had inside our student community, the Insiders Club, a couple of weeks ago. And it was all about how to decide which photos to keep and which ones you can get rid of. And I thought this was such a great question. And I think it's something that regardless of what type of photography you do or even how long you've been shooting, that we can all struggle with from time to time. So I'm going to answer that today, but before I dive into that, I do want to quickly remind you about what the Live Snap Love Insiders Club actually is. So we have a Facebook community that is exclusively for Live Snap Love students. It's a great place where you can meet other people who are on the same journey as you and from all over the globe. I think one of my most favorite things about the group is just how diverse it is, both in terms of the type of photographers we have and from where everyone is. We've got people from Japan, from Canada, Australia, France, the Netherlands, the UK, America, everywhere. And it's fantastic to see so many different photos in the group. It's really, really inspiring. But better yet, it's also just such a wonderfully warm and supportive community. So it's a fantastic place to share your photos. In fact, many of our students find that because it's a closed group that's only open to students, it's just so much nicer and less, uh, how should I put this, mean than other free groups that are open to everyone. Now, each month as a bonus, I go live where I answer questions or just generally chat about photography or just talk about something that our students would like a little bit of input on. So I'm reminding you of this because if you are a student and you're not in the group, go get in there now. I would absolutely love to meet you and I'm sure everyone else would as well. So just go into the course that you're a student of and right there in the welcome module is your invite to join the group. So go forth, join, and I will see you in there. Now, if you are not a student, but you would like to join the group, then becoming a student is the way to get in there. Just go to livesnaplove.com forward slash courses and buy anything on that page and you'll get an invite to join. But back to today's podcast episode, where I'm answering a question in a live Q&A call that went like this. Audrey, I have trouble picking and choosing what photos to delete. I want to just keep my best shots, but I find it hard to let some go. I'm talking personal photos here and also wildlife landscape photos. I feel like my photos are somewhat of a journal. I just know that I can't go on taking photos and not deleting more. I'm curious as to how you decide what photos to let go and what ones to keep. So this is a great question and overshooting and having more photos than I needed and having, you know, 10 photos of the same thing was something that I was really guilty of back in the early days of my photography journey. I would simply take a lot of photos, sometimes several photos of the same thing, and I would end up with, you know, images cluttering up my hard drive that were essentially the same photo over and over again, but with tiny little differences. And I would spend a long time having to cull my photos and decide which ones to keep and which ones should go. So that's why I really thought it would be a great one to answer today, because over the years, I feel I've managed to kind of fine tune my process. It's not ideal. I don't just take the photos that I'm going to keep and that's it. I have no culling to do whatsoever. It's not that. But I come back with much less photos in the first place. And when I'm culling, I'm much more intentional about which ones I keep and which ones I get rid of. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about how I do that. And the first thing that I'm doing is I'm starting the process when I'm actually shooting. So 
really, I'm not thinking about which photos to keep and which ones to, to get rid of just in my computer. I'm mentally thinking of that when I'm actually shooting. So my goal is always to shoot more intentionally and stop overshooting when you come back with a memory card filled with 10 variations of the same picture. So when I'm doing this, I'm actually always thinking about the end destination or generally. So in other words, why am I taking these pictures and what am I going to do with them? Am I here to document a moment in time? Is it to tell a story? Am I going to put them in my family photo books? Is it a photo that I want to frame on my wall? Is it just because I love seeing the beauty in something and I want to capture that and remember that moment? So I'm starting to think about why I'm taking the photo and the end destination for it. And this helps me when I'm shooting because if I'm shooting for my uh, documentary style family photo books, which is really what we did when our days and events, then I shoot in a different way than if I am shooting something that is a family portrait, for example. I have a different framework that I shoot to. Now, I did actually create two shooting frameworks that I have, and I use these both or together or one or the other, depending on what I'm shooting. So I have one called the Impacts Shooting Framework, which is something that I use when I am trying to tell a story or document an event. And it really helps keep me on track to know which photos to take, to make sure that I tell the story in a cohesive way. And I have a variety of pictures that help me to do that. If I'm shooting more portraits, either to hang on my wall or for someone else, or I'm photographing an item, say a flower, then I use what I have called the Ripple Framework. And again, this just helps me take a variety of photographs of the same thing so that I have a number of photographs to choose from, and but they're not 10 of the exact same thing. So both of these really help keep me on track to make sure that I get a wide variety of photos in the first place and that I don't overshoot because once I've got one image at a certain point, I know I've got it, I can then finish and then I can move on. And it really stops me from overshooting. So that's the first thing I do. I start shooting more intentionally in camera by thinking about the end destination and using my shooting frameworks to make sure that I capture that wide variety of shots, but don't overshoot. Now, I've actually included both of those shooting frameworks in my Auto to Awesome program. So if you are already a student, just go into the course and in module six, all on composition, you'll find them there along with cheat sheets that you can download to help you remember them. Uh, if you're not a student, you can go and find out more about Auto to Awesome at livesnaplove.com forward slash auto dash two dash awesome. I will link to it in the show notes for this episode, which you'll find around about where you're listening to this podcast, or just go to livesnaplove.com forward slash 31. So the second stage happens in the editing suite. So once I have uploaded my photos, I use Lightroom and they're in Lightroom. Then I then start my culling process and I kind of go through the images once with a kind of gut reaction. So in the, that first pass, I'm really getting rid of all of the photos that are bad because there are some that might be out of focus, um, maybe somebody's eyes closed, or I get it back and I think that's just not very interesting. You know, I've taken some photos of a flower from a certain angle and I think, no, it's dull, it's boring, just want to get rid of it. So my first pass gets rid of all these really bad photos and I actually delete them immediately. There is no point in them cluttering up my drive. They can go. So I immediately mark them. I flag them as a reject and I immediately delete them. And then I can go through and I look for the ones that are great. So there will always be when you have any kind of shoot, regardless of what it is, whether that's your documentary style photos, whether that's photos of a bird or macro photos of something, 
or portraits, you'll go through and you'll think that one is a keeper. I love that photo. There's something about the light or the expression or the moment or the movement. There's something that takes that photo and elevates it. It's a five-star photo. So I do actually mark those as five stars or I can mark them with a pick depending on the process you have. And so now I've got rid of all my bad photos and I have my five-star photos. And then what you're left with is this range of photos that aren't bad enough to be bad photos and they're not good enough to be there in the great pile. And this is where I go back to my shooting process because now I'm thinking, what is the end destination for these photos? Do I just want a photo for my wall? Do I want to create a spread in my photo book? So I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about that same shooting frameworks. The one I used when I was there shooting in camera, I then refer back to those when I am culling my photos. So let me give you an example of that. So let's say that I am shooting for my family photo book and I'm documenting a day at the beach. Well, I know that I've gotten rid of all those bad photos and I have some of my great ones, but I kind of want to round it out and tell the story of the day. So therefore, I'm looking at my shooting framework that I use and I am creating that spread of photos that help tell the day. And I'm narrowing that down because I know that I want to put that into my family photo book. These aren't going on the wall. They're not being generally shared for anyone else. They're for me and my family to look back on in years to come. In which case, I know that I don't really want any more than 12 photos. So I'm sticking with my impact shooting framework, which gives me at least sort of seven photos. And then I can add in a few more that takes me maybe to my 12 or I stick there with my seven. And the reason I have that is in my photo books, I like to have that photo book spread where I have one main image on one side and then six images on the other side. Or sometimes I do two pages of six or, you know, it depends on the amount of photos I have. But I'm thinking about that when culling. And that really helps me narrow them down because I don't need five photos essentially showing the same thing. I need to narrow that down to one or two. And if I was photographing a flower, maybe I want to put that on my wall. I only really really need one great photo, but I might want to keep some of the other ones because they're great. But again, I look to my ripple shooting framework and I get rid of any images that are very similar. I just have to make choices about which photo is best. And it might come down to a small thing, might just come down to the composition. It might come down to the light was slightly better in one than another. It might just come back to one was slightly more in focus than the other one when I really get down and look at them. But essentially, I'm narrowing it down so that I only have one or two types of photos of the same thing. We don't want hundreds of photos that essentially tell the same thing. And again, I'm looking at that end result. This probably, this might go into my photo book. I might do a smaller uh, page spread on that, but generally they don't go into my photo book. Maybe when I create a macro photography book, which I want to do one day, then I'll probably still only have one or two photos of that thing. So I really narrow them down a whole lot more. So I'm doing that two things. I'm doing that when I'm shooting. I'm thinking about the end destination. I'm working to my shooting frameworks. And then when I get back into culling, I'm first of all getting rid of all that bad photos immediately, keeping all the great photos as definites, And then I'm using that shooting frameworks again and my thoughts on that end destination to narrow them down to an acceptable limit. Now, if I were shooting a paid session for a family, for example, then I am going to end up with more than 12 photos. I'm going to give them several to choose from. And in which case I do meander slightly away from this. But again, I've still been using my Ripple shooting frameworks. I'm not going to give them 20 photos of essentially the same thing. I am going to narrow them down for them. I'm not going to make them choose between 10 different photos of them in, you know, basically the same pose, but with slight differences. I am going to narrow that down and give them two or three, for example, full body ones. And then I'll move in again and then I'll do more 
choices and options than the half body ones. So I'm really giving them a wider choice. So instead of me culling it down to one, you know, full body portrait, for example, I'm giving them a choice of three or five and so on. So it is slightly different if I'm shooting for someone else because we're giving them that end choice that we're taking. But I'm kind of doing it in the same way. I'm going through, I'm getting rid of any bad ones. I'm keeping my five star great ones. They might make it onto the blog or they might do something else with them. But then those middle of the road ones, then I'm going to let the clients decide which of those they prefer. Sometimes they'll see something that they don't like about themselves or they like a expression on their child because it just breaks their heart in a way that we don't have that emotional reaction to. So definitely when you're doing this for clients, you're going to have a wider range of images. But again, you can still use that same principle. You're still using that. I'm not giving them 20 photos of the same thing. I'm giving them three or five. Now, don't forget, you can get the shooting frameworks that I've mentioned inside Auto to Awesome. If you are a student, just go into the course and grab them. And if you're not a student and you are interested in learning more about how to shoot in manual mode, how to use the available light for beautiful photos, how to use composition, get tack sharp images every time, then do make sure that you check out Auto to Awesome because it teaches you how to do all of that and more. You can find out more about the program by going to livesnaplove.com forward slash auto dash two dash awesome. And by the way, that two is not the number two, it is the word two. And you will find more information about it there. You'll also find a link to it around where you're listening to this podcast. So that's it for this week. Once again, thank you so much for being here. And I'll see you again, same time, same place next week. Bye for now.